everyone. It's wonderful to welcome you. I want to welcome you with a word of poetry written by a Brown alum. And it was inspired by something I preached, which I honestly have to say I forgot. But she sent it to me just the other day. And it says, only spring is certain. For there is nothing that is so dead that it does not burst like magnolias into radiant pink. If you're ever sitting in Manning Chapel in just a few weeks, you will see these trees and they do just burst. And I'm sure that must have been my illustration of that sermon. But I found myself thinking on this eve of spring, we have the incredible privilege um, for our annual Mary Interlandi Memorial Lecture. We've been debating what number to give it. Um, is it the 20th? Is it the 19th? I counted 19 scholars, but we would say it's the 20th. Um, but most importantly, it's, it's a lecture where John and Beth are here. So I wanted to make, embarrass them a little bit, make them stand up so you can all applaud. Mm -hmm. We really think um, that any year when they're able to join us is just a better year than the others. And they've brought other family with them as well. So thank you for um, joining us. It, it's an extraordinary thing to witness that when the worst happens, losing Mary is just a sorrow that I don't care how many times my mouth forms the words. I know that the words are inadequate. But in that inadequacy grew exactly what my friend writes about. This burst of color, this commitment to life, and this decision that you made in that moment to bring to Brown an opportunity for us to learn and to study things that Mary held dear. Um, only you knew that. We were barely getting to know her, and she had ventured around in a lot of places where afterward people could say, oh my gosh, she was amazing in my gender studies course. She was amazing in her study and interest in Buddhism, but her studies had just begun. And so I'll never find it comfortable to stand here and say anything but that we lost her much too soon. But the things she planted, the things that she cared about, you had known since she was a child. And those things are blossoming here beyond the sorrow of her loss. And I don't know that there are words adequate still for us to say thank you, but they're the only ones I've got. Um, if my French were better, I would try with the, or the French organist to do something more musical. Um, but this fund that lovingly bears her name really means to celebrate her life and the embrace of her life and things that she was just beginning to know and love, her time in Nepal, her time in study, beginning to study Buddhism, her interest in meditation and contemplative studies. So for the chaplains, this partnership that we have long been able to enjoy thanks to your generosity is just something that really feels to me like beautiful at the beginning, but ever more beautiful as the years go by. And what an incredible privilege for us to welcome Professor Shaw but we were just saying that the list of folks who have come as our teachers is just an extraordinary list. So um, for Mary's life and for all it's inspired, for your generosity and kindness to us to continue to teach us and to enable us to grow, my words are thank you. To Hal and to Anne, um, thank you, because they do all the heavy lifting, thinking about which is the next right teacher and how should we do this and how can people come and meditate more than we even thought could happen. These are just blessings upon blessings. Um, and for that to burst forth, it is like the magnolias. So some year maybe we'll be doing this when the magnolias are in bloom. And um, if that's true, maybe we'll even go to Manning so we can look at them out the window. Magnolias, just like Buddhism, very interesting because once the blossoms drop, they're very treacherous. You can slip on them like a banana peel. And to me, that's a spiritual lesson as well, right? Gorgeous but potentially just a little dangerous um, and important that we kind of welcome all of it. So um, I think Mary might have thought that too, but I didn't have the privilege to know her. So welcome to Beth and John. Welcome to all of you. And on behalf of the chaplains, let me just say a warm thank you. Um, Professor Shaw, we look forward to learning with you. And Hal's going to do the proper introduction because I would not thank do you it justice. Oh, no, no, thank you. I couldn't possibly uh, speak more eloquently than Janet, our, our chaplain, has just done about uh, 
the uh, debt of gratitude we owe to uh, John and Beth uh, Interlandy and all of Mary's friends and family for their great generosity that came out of such grief and, and the incredible thoughtfulness um, in helping us to establish contemplative studies and continue with contemplative studies. Um, when um, uh, Mary was a student in, um, I think it was Great Mystical Traditions, uh, or Mysticism East and West, perhaps, um, we started uh, talking about the idea of, uh, wouldn't it be interesting if we could not only teach contemplative practices to university students, but we could somehow integrate that into a course curriculum? How could we do that? Um, and I um, had put a, a small group together uh, to start talking about this. We brought in some guest speakers and we met uh, every few weeks. And from time to time I would talk to students um, in my course uh, about the idea of doing this, uh, this, this contemplative studies, how to integrate it um, into the curriculum. And, uh, and then we started uh, little by little uh, with one course here and one course there. Uh, and I wanna, there's somebody here tonight who I wanna uh, thanks so much for helping out with so much of the administrative work before uh, we were able to have the funding to have uh, to, to be in, begin to hire an administrative assistant such as the wonderful Anne Hart without without whom none of this would be happening so let's take a moment to thank Anne. <laughs> But before Anne arrived, there was somebody else who really uh, kind of um, uh, on the side, uh, in addition to all of the work that she did for religious studies, uh, she was the religious studies office manager. Um, uh, and she helped me, and w there was no remuneration for it. It was out of the goodness of her heart uh, that she did that. And I would like to ask, and she still comes to our events. She's been retired for a number of years now. I won't say how many. Uh, she has recovered from St. Patrick's Day weekend celebrations, <laughs> uh, as she told me. Gail Tetra, would you please stand up and let us acknowledge you. Thank you, Gail. Little by little, we started with uh, advising uh, independent concentrators and uh, started to raise uh, funds uh, external to Brown uh, to help support uh, bringing in a series of uh, lectures. Um, and little by little more, we gathered more faculty. Um, uh, and I want to particularly mention a number of people tonight who are here. Uh, Willoughby Britton, hi Will, uh, was our first uh, real contemplative scientist who came to Brown. Um, and her partner, Jared Lindahl, uh, they, and they team teach for us now. Um, uh, scholar uh, trained at uh, UC Santa Barbara um, in religious studies. Um, and then uh, also little by little we started um, bringing more faculty in. So Dr. Srinivas Reddy, who has literally this weekend just returned from India, who teaches our courses on pre-modern Hinduism. Um, Srini and <laughs> Willoughby and Jared. And um, we started going to conferences and we started talking about the ideas that we had about integrating uh, the sciences and the humanities and the arts and the social sciences. And now with the social sciences most recently, I want to also acknowledge the, uh, the, uh, acting, the, for the former acting director and potentially ag again, will someday once again be acting director. Um, uh, Professor Michael Kennedy of the Sociology Department. <laughs> little by little, we've uh, built uh, a strong uh, core of uh, faculty, uh, both uh, people who, oh, and how could I, how, <laughs> because he's sitting a, about as far back as he could, because he thought we might, I might say something about him this evening. <laughs> Uh, so, so most of you cannot see, but please attempt to crane your necks behind you to see Professor Larson D. Fiore, <laughs> part of our contemplative studies faculty and community. Uh, I, I think that uh, many of us are um, committed to the idea that it's possible uh, to be uh, both a practitioner and a scholar and a critical scholar within 
within the, the university, within higher education. And we feel that contemplative studies is a field that encourages that. And I want to say that um, in, in um, uh, recognition of the fact that this hasn't just been our, uh, our own particular unique brown insanity, um, uh, upwards of 25 other colleges and universities have created programs now that have copied various elements of ours in contemplative studies, most of them called contemplative studies. And uh, in the past uh, year and a half, we've created a new international association of scholars and scientists working in contemplative research. We had our inaugural meeting in uh, uh, February in, uh, at the University of California, San Diego campus. And we're talking about having a, another meeting uh, next year in Padua, Italy, where believe it or not, um, the University of Padua has established Europe's first master's program in contemplative studies, uh, which uh, has actually filled all of its 60 places and will have 60 more places for anybody who's interested in pursuing uh, contemplative studies in Italy. But I think you have to speak Italian. So only uh, Leah um, <laughs> is uh, able to do this right now from the Mindfulness Center. Um, so that's a bit of the background. So, so, the, so the, the thoughtfulness and generosity and goodwill of John and Beth and your, your parents and your friends um, um, in the, with the background of, of such, a, such an intense personal tragedy and loss, you have helped build something that I think is really going to, it, 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 the seeds have been planted here, we have grown a lot here and, and the seeds are now spreading not only throughout North America but throughout the world. And so uh, it's with a, a, a great humility and, and deep appreciation that I thank you uh, for your generosity. Um, and uh, I welcome all of you to learn more about contemplative studies. Um, please go to our website. Uh, we have information about how to concentrate. Uh, we have a few, any concentrators here? I haven't, any, any contemplative studies concentrators? Oh yes, James. <laughs> so. And, uh, and former concentrators, so, uh, uh, so James is a current concentrator, and Chloe, uh, and uh, uh, sitting back there, Chloe, hand, hands up, and Liz uh, Kaplan. And, and uh, uh, Chloe is so devoted to being at Brown uh, that not only was she an undergrad here, uh, but she has uh, spent three years, uh, really in many ways, running the uh, lab of Kathy Kerr, the late Kathy Kerr, whom we very much still miss. Um, uh, who, who, uh, and that lab has done some very interesting work on uh, um, uh, Qigong practices, Ch Chinese energetic practices as part of a treatment for healing uh, women with cancer. Um, and uh, Chloe likes it so much here that she's uh, enrolled in the MD PhD program and so we will be seeing a lot of Chloe, thankfully, for a long time to come. So um, I want to recognize Chloe and Liz and James. If you would like to learn more as students about the concentration, please talk to them. Um, and so finally, uh, I want to thank you all for coming. But I particularly want to thank our speaker, um, uh, Dr. Sarah Shaw. Uh, now, what year is this? 2023. So it's about. 10, 12, 14, 15 years ago, I first learned about uh, Dr. Shaw, uh, her work. Uh, she'd uh, written a wonderful overview article um, on uh, Theravada Buddhist meditation, actually the best thing that I'd, that I'd, written, uh, that I'd seen written. Um, and uh, shortly after that, discovered her wonderful 2006 anthology in which she systematically went through the entire uh, normative uh, Theravada Buddhist canon. So this is the, the oldest continuous tradition of Buddhism that starts um, in India sometime around 400 BCE. Um, it's, it's, we don't know exactly, but sometime around then. Um, and she collected all of the texts on meditation in the Pali Canon. She did wonderful English translations. Of, of all of these texts, um, and uh, brilliant introductions, uh, uh, contextualizing each one of them and pointing out the key ideas. So I want to recommend that. In fact, um, students here have been reading that 
um, in Introduction to Contemplative Studies and other courses I teach for, for uh, probably a decade or so. Um, and she's also subsequently uh, uh, done this wonderful translation of, of the Jataka stories, which are, are tales uh, from the Buddha's life that are, that, uh, you know, the, the, the Buddha's previous lives that are used a, as part of uh, teaching Buddhism, t both to children and to people who, who um, don't know anything about Buddhism. Uh, and they're also part of the original Pali Canon. Uh, she's most recently done a book on mindfulness, um, uh, and which is the topic she will address this evening. We first met at a conference on, um, what was it called? Um, uh, meditation in different cultures, cultural histories of meditation uh, with uh, 40 specialists in meditation, all different meditation traditions from all over the world. That was in Oslo, uh, well, it started out in Oslo, Norway, and we ended up actually being Shanghai to a, a, a retreat center that was run by a, a, a semi-cult. But anyway, this is a, a story that <laughs> it, it, it produced friendships and bonding, let's put it that way, which probably wouldn't or ordinarily have been produced. And uh, uh, we, uh, we started um, uh, talking and realizing that we had uh, a lot in common and we were both believers in the importance of, of not only being a, a good, careful textual scholar, but also grounding that textual work in contemplative practice. So I don't know if we're contemplative uh, um, scholar practitioners or practitioner scholars, but we're one or the other. And, and wh whatever uh, uh, each of us is, I, at this moment, am extremely pleased to introduce and ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Shaw, the world's leading, the world's leading translator of uh, Theravada classical Buddhist texts on meditation from Pali into English. Well, I don't know where to begin after all of that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Janet, for such a warm and creative welcome and such a, um, an apt simile for the arising of mindfulness or alertness. And thank you, Hal, for your introduction. And thank you, Anne, of course, for all your work. And thank you, um, John and Beth, for your continued support and for your family who's here. Um, uh, I met Hal at, at, at this conference in Norway, and we instantly recognized in each other just a wish for a kind of enjoyment of philosophical texts about meditation, that people could actually study philosophy in the ancient sense of philosophia, things that had meaning for them. And it's such a rare thing to find this or to find somebody else who feels that. We, we had an immediate rapport. And since then, I've come to know uh, Liz very well. And uh, it seems that certainly in, in Buddhist texts, the, the foundation of all kind of spiritual work and inquiry is friendliness and generosity. And it's the same in the Indic traditions. And of course, it is the same in Christianity that that feeling of warmth brings out the best in people, like the magnolia in the sunshine. So thank you very much, and I'm, I'm very delighted to be here. Now, what happens after mindfulness? Now, many of us would like to just find out what happens in mindfulness. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I have always been spectacularly unmindful, which is why I, I work on it. Uh, my husband said I... I kept an objective distance from the subject. <laughs> so it is something we all want to find and to, to cultivate. But there is more, of course, than mindfulness. <coughs> Excuse me. So what I'm going to try and do in this talk is to look at the context in which the Buddha first taught mindfulness, which I don't think is so separate from 
many qualities we find in the other religious traditions of the world. The Sikhs, in particular, put a great emphasis on alertness in daily life. Um, there is alertness in the Hindu traditions. If you read the accounts of prayer in St. Teresa's uh, autobiography, The Stages of Prayer, it is quite clear she is alert and mindful. If you read about the Philokalia, you could, these, these early Christian texts on meditation, you could be reading about mindfulness. The, the word may not be used, but the, what is being aroused and encouraged is quite clearly comparable. So it seems very apt to come to Brown, and I know you have a history of um, not needing a particular religious affiliation to study uh, subjects. And, and I think this is a particularly interesting quality because it really does transcend uh, traditions. Um, I think the, the Israelites, when they were being chosen for battle, some of them just plunged into the water. They, they, they were all sent to bathe. But some of them just looked around, made sure they were safe, and they were the ones who were chosen as the, the good soldiers because they were, they were mindful. So let's look at what happened before the word mindfulness in the sense that we mean it of a kind of alertness. Let's look in ancient India and see what it meant before the Buddha. And I know, Srini, you, you will know much more about this than, than me. So <laughs> I'm very happy to defer to anything you have to say on it. So what happened before mindfulness? And this is the word shmerti before the time of the Buddha. I have asked about, I think I've asked about 20 Vedic scholars and Sanskritists about this. Um, and they say that by and large, it means either memory, um, the, the verb is uh, smarity, to remember, or uh, Patrick Olivelle suggests a textualized form of memory. And this is because in ancient India, texts were always passed on orally as, as Buddhist texts were. People wouldn't have written them down. So your religious teaching, your meditative practice would only really be existent when somebody was practicing it, when somebody was reciting it and chanting it. So the Vedas are, are, are an act of recreation of the tradition in a pre-literate society. And it doesn't mean um, that people didn't have extraordinary skills that we actually lack now, because they did. Um, they could bring to life the tradition. And there are so many uh, what they call deictic pronouns in very early Vedic texts, where they point up or down or here. These are pronouns that try and place somebody in their lo location. So Smriti was memory, yes, because they had to memorize these texts, but it was a memory that brought things into the present. And I feel that is how the Buddha interpreted it. It was sometimes used, I understand, as a kind of noting or adverting of the mind, but uh, it had a slightly different meaning from the one it acquires in, in Buddhism at that time. So, so I, it seems to me that this sense was latent in ancient India of memory actually being about the present, that you're bringing something to life in the present. When you chant the Vedas, we see these um, little boys learning how to chant the Brahmin, boys learning how to chant their sacred texts. They would see themselves as doing, using memory to create something good in the present, to arouse something in the present. So let's look at the Buddha, who brought quite a different understanding of mindfulness, but it still had those, those roots. And um, I like the uh, arboreal image of something coming up from mindfulness because there is a sense that it is something that gives rise to other qualities and that it's an earth on which other things can grow and develop. 
So I've tried to look at some context for the word sati and smirti. Now, um, we do like clinical definitions in our society, and, and Buddhism does do this. And I'm actually from a medical family, so you know everybody in my family wants to know the exact definition of, of something. So I, I appreciate that. I would have to say that in early Buddhist texts, although you do get plenty of definitions, you get also lots of different applications. And it's like so many words. It's just used in a lot of different ways. And you can't just say it is only one thing. So I had a look through. And in that uh, book, which I leave there, I, I just had a look at some different ways mindfulness gets used according to the, the need of the time. So we have mindfulness is a noting. And this is something that's very strong, actually, in the Sanskrit literature after the time of the Buddha as well, that it starts to be more noting. I would say in Pali literature, it's there, but not, not so much that we note things when we're around us. So it has this quality of noting. It retains the quality of memory. Um, at the time of the Buddha, uh, there was no writing, so people had to remember the texts. And there was still a sense that when you recited, you chanted your texts, you were arousing, if you like, a kind of mindfulness of the tradition. Um, you, were, you were bringing it into being. Uh, it's got the sense of guarding, and we're going to have a look at some texts with the, do, which suggests that. It's got the sense also of cheering you up, that, um, as we'll see, there's, um, you can actually use mindfulness to cheer yourself up. And it can be sustained at all times, in all postures, even when asleep. So we're looking at something that's really shifted in meaning from the, the earlier Vedic and Sanskrit use. And the Buddha liked to do this with words, to shift them around a bit. As, as we all do, there are all sorts of words we tend to move and change uh, according to our needs. And mindfulness is not some rigid thing that is only this. It is a quality which is there in, um, we could say, recollection the, of St. Augustine when he talked about recollecting. He's talking about mindfulness. Somebody said to me once, but there wasn't any mindfulness in the Christian tradition. I said, well, <laughs> perhaps you need to read St. Augustine <laughs> and see that actually it is there all the time. He's talking about what is in effect mindfulness in the uh, various aspects. So, and, and it can be there in, in uh, an awareness of the breath. And some of us were doing breathing mindfulness yesterday. And it's there in, in loving kindness. Uh, loving kindness is actually described as mindfulness in, early, in a very early Buddhist text, the Sutta Nibbata. Uh, and we will see that. So there are lots of different applications. So quite clearly, there is a mindfulness I need when I'm crossing the road, particularly in the States, because I'm liable to walk right into a car. So I have to be mindful. But this quality is supposed to be there also when we practice deep meditation. It's said to be there in the most profound meditations, the jhanas, and it's there at the moment of path. So that it's something which isn't more rarefied or different from anything else we experience. The understanding is that we actually have an innate predisposition to be mindful, which we've sort of forgotten, <laughs> and that we just have to bring it back. And it will help us then to find all these other states as well. Now, I don't think, and I may be wrong, I'm not a perennialist, I don't think. But I still feel that most of the religious traditions have this sense of an alertness which needs to be um, present at all times and at, at all areas of practice. So we can discuss that afterwards, see what people think. So this is the one definition of mindfulness. This is what you could say is a clinical definition of mindfulness from a early Buddhist text. Uh, the mindfulness, which at that time is a recollection, a bringing back to mind, the mindfulness that is remembering, holding steady in the mind, 
not drifting away, not being bewildered, the mindfulness that is a faculty, it's a power, and it's right, it's correctly aligned. This at that time is the faculty of mindfulness. I think that would be, it would be generally agreed that's the, the standard Buddhist definition of being mindful. And here is one which is often given as well. And what is right mindfulness? Now, this is the mindfulness which actually steers us in the right direction. It's when a mendicant, a practitioner, practices by observing the body, ardent, clearly comprehending, and mindful, put is, putting aside longing and grief for the world. They practice observing feeling, ardent, clearly comprehending, comprehending and mindful, putting aside longing and grief for the world. They practice observing the mind, ardent, clearly comprehending and mindful, putting aside longing and aversion for the world. They practice observing all events that arise, ardent, clearly comprehending, mindful, putting aside longing and grief for the world. This is called right mindfulness. Now, I think this is interesting because I think we'll come back to this. When I first started being interested in mindfulness, it was very much a niche term that nobody had heard about. Um, and now I can go to, into any um, doctor's surgery and I'll, I'll be told to be mindful. If I drop a cup, I did it at a, a village fete in England recently. Somebody said, Sarah, I thought you were working on mindfulness. Aren't you supposed to be a bit more alert? Everybody knows what it means. Um, but it seems to me that the, the great spiritual traditions of the world have used this quality not as just something to um, make one more alert during the day, though that is very helpful and needed all the time, but as a quality which of itself helps us to bring us to deeper levels of experience. And it is not... I think the, the word one would say it's not deracinated. It hasn't lost its roots in these traditions. It's something which comes from our own experience and, and literally deracinated. It, it literally comes from our own body and from a tradition that takes into account people and their needs. And throughout uh, Buddhist teachings on mindfulness, we have this sense of the importance of the, per the person, of being able to talk about your meditation practice, uh, being able to be with other people, and to have a sense of community. And these are considered very important for right mindfulness, to, for these qualities to arouse. So let's go on to another way it is used. And in this sense, it protects. Um, a favorite image for mindfulness in the, that's a, an Indian fort. Um, these could be in very lonely and dangerous places and they needed guarding. And a frequent image that the Buddha gives but for mindfulness and for mindfulness of the body is that if we guard ourselves, we protect ourselves if we are mindful of our body. And he compares it to a royal outpost city on the borders where there is a gatekeeper, shrewd, experienced and wise, who refuses entry to those that he does not know and admits those he does. And it is guarded for the protection of those inside and the exclusion of those outside. Just so, the noble disciple is mindful, endowed with the highest degree of mindfulness and care, remembering, recollecting things done long ago and said long ago. With mindfulness as the gatekeeper, the noble disciple abandons the unskillful and brings into being the skillful. He abandons what is blameworthy and cultivates what's irreproachable. So these are, uh, obviously, it's the language of a, a religious text, but it, it's also there in very basic meditation advice where, you're, um, the, where the breath meets the nose 
is the gatekeeper. And that if you are aware of the breath coming in and the breath coming out, perhaps being aware of the tip of the nose, you are guarded and protected. Your body is protected by that awareness of your rootedness and where you are. So it's a nice image of, of protection uh, that mindfulness will give us. Um, and I think we need to remember this because I know there's been a lot of publicity recently to uh, mindfulness being uh, dangerous. And in a sense, it is dangerous in a good way <laughs> in that it will actually bring uh, very different kinds of experience. But it is not dangerous if basic procedures are followed. And I have read extensively now on some of the supposed problems of mindfulness meditation. And in each case, and I've discussed this with friends, in each case I've looked at, I think with the exception of one, um, it was quite clear that if that person had had a chance to have a good chat about their meditation, somebody who would listen to them and who would discuss it with them, um, which is the traditional way of Southeast Asian Buddhism. Um, I wouldn't say the problems would have been averted, but they would have been greatly minimized. And I do know people who have had um, psychotic episodes going on some meditation retreats where, I know too, where that chance was not given. They subsequently went on a meditation retreat where they had a chance to discuss with other people the problems to do with their meditation and how it was going and just were made sure before they left the retreat that they knew where they were going next and what they were going to do. And they have overcome all those problems quite spectacularly. Um, our minds are very sensitive and we are communal creatures. And if you have a chance to chat about your meditation, it is very rare that you would have a problem that cannot be dealt with by m basic mindfulness of, of the body and of the breath. And that may sound like rather a categorical statement, but in my experience, that has been the case. And um, I think it's a very interesting discussion point, too. So people might like to, to raise that afterwards. Now, the other thing about mindfulness is this is where it comes. It doesn't come on its own. It comes with lots of other things. So the, the little text that talks about mindfulness as being like the gatekeeper actually says that uh, mindfulness, and this is this lovely expression Bhikkhu Bodhi used, it always comes with a constellation of friends, <laughs> of other factors, um, with which it works as a company. So we have uh, the city pillar is like faith. Uh, there is self-respect, like a moat, that protects you from doing things which uh, um, uh, when you could lose your sense of worth. Um, <coughs> you have a rampart where you can see danger coming. You don't do things that are reckless. And you have your well-stocked with armory, which you do need in a border town at that time. And you have a lot of vigor. So these, these it's in a way, this city is, is ourselves that we, we need to be protected. But as you can see, you don't just have a gatekeeper. You've got to have all sorts of other supports as well. So mindfulness comes with a lot of other things to help it. Moving to a very different quality of mindfulness, though it is still serving this function of protecting we look at mindfulness of the breath. Now, this is where I think the Buddha really did, if you like, transform the meaning of the word. And I've looked, I'm looking here at the second tetrad of the breathing mindfulness uh, sutta. The first one is concerned with whether you're having a long breath or a short breath. And I felt this one was particularly interesting because there are 16 stages and there would be a lot to go into all of them. But I thought it'd be interesting to look at just these four. I shall breathe in experiencing joy. They train. They train. I shall breathe out experiencing joy. Now, 
But this seems to me to be a very different use of mindfulness, that you can actually introduce joy with the breath and breathe out joy. And I was extremely skeptical about this, so I suggest that at some point you just try it. Maybe not here in the, in the, uh, <laughs> it might not work here, but just while you're out for a walk, just see if you can breathe in joy, because actually it is very interesting. It's as if it sends, I think, a subconscious me message to you to, to arouse joy. And this is a mindfulness. So we're moving away from just alertness to something which is actually doing something a little bit active and guiding intention. I shall breathe in experiencing happiness, they train. I shall breathe out experiencing happiness. I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body of the mind. And this is this very, what you could say is a somatic understanding in Buddhism that in this fathom long body is all the arising and the ceasing of the word of the world. So that if you can experience your whole body and be mindful of it, you are actually experiencing your mind as well. Uh, I shall breathe in making the body of the mind or the, the, the kaya of all the mental factors tranquil and I shall breathe out making them tranquil. On that occasion, a mendicant abides contemplating feelings as feelings. This is the feeling tetrad. Ardent, fully comprehending and mindful, putting away longing and grief for the world. I say that this is a certain feeling among the feelings, namely giving close attention to the in-breathing and the out-breathing. That is why on that occasion, a mendicant abides contemplating feelings as feelings, ardent, clearly comprehending and mindful, putting away longing and grief for the world. So this is looking at really the choice or the, the sense that mindfulness involves a choice to change our mental state. And um, mindfulness of the breath helps us to do this particularly and I was looking at actually the Philokalia where it talks about mindfulness of the breath. Again, it doesn't use the word mindfulness, but it talks about being aware of the breath and bringing it right through the heart and the feeling and then allowing the king, I think the kingdom of heaven to open in, the, in one's experience. Quite clearly, this, it's talking about this, that we have the reserves to do this. So I think that's something... Um, Perhaps people might like to experiment with uh, during the week or just try out a bit. Because you think, well, it's impossible. How can that happen? But actually, you can cheer your breath. So we're getting a very different orientation with mindfulness, that it isn't just the observation. It's actually steering the mind in another direction. And here we have the, the very famous metta sort of the discourse on loving kindness, and this is a, a ceremonial text. It's chanted. If you want to commemorate a new building, you'll always chant this text. If you want to welcome a new baby, you, you'd chant it. Um, if, if there are ghosts anywhere, you should chant it. It's one of these ones that has a very auspicious effect. And um, it is also quite simple meditational advice as well. Radiating kindness over the entire world spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and limitless, freed from hatred and ill will, standing, sitting or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one can sustain this mindfulness. It's called a mindfulness, this loving kindness. This, they say, is living in a heaven realm. It's living in a heaven, a Brahma heaven, here in this world. So... This is a very different and interesting perspective on mindfulness, which we won't find in, in the textbooks, that just the very um, attempt to make the mind friendly towards events that are going on inside and outside will actually transform our experience of the world. And that if we are friendly to all the phenomena that arise inside and outside, and both inside and outside, we will find that things change. 
uh, you know, people may start to change in their behavior to you at a very simple level. But of course, at a very um, deep, much deeper level, there will be a sense that something, the contents of um, the mind and, and our bodies seem different. They feel different. So this is moving away from mindfulness in, in a very um, simple sense. I think there's non-judgmental awareness, which it certainly is, but it has some, so many more properties with which it's capable. So I think to summarize uh, that little bit, we'll say that for the Buddha, right mindfulness is a subtle, even intuitive awareness that can be sustained at all times in all situations. Uh, and there is a text that says that it can never be enough mindfulness. It knows no limits, and it leads somewhere. So let's just have a look at where it's supposed to lead. And I know everybody here is, I mean, it's quite extraordinary at Brown how you've done so much study on aspects of mindfulness and contemplation. I don't know anywhere else, actually, where, where people have studied this these um, qualities, both in, in the cognitive sciences, but also in contemplative studies. So I think I would be very interested to know how you felt about the list we're going to look at. Uh, I'll introduce, first of all, what Abhidhamma is. This is the early Buddhist psychology and philosophical system. It always gets called a little bit scholastic, which, and it does have scholarly um, angles to it. Um, but I think it's really describing mind and its relationship to matter uh, at any moment. And this is how it's taken in the Southeast Asian traditions. I was very lucky to be introduced to it in the 70s and the 80s by um, Abhidhamma teachers who uh, Venerable Chandawana, Venerable Yunyanika, Venerable Yutitila, who were people who just thought of it as that's how you view your mind. They didn't see it in a scholarly sense. It would be almost like a checklist so that if they had a meditation state, well, they'd say, well, which chitta was present then? It, it was much more like a, a practical guide to understanding your own psychological map. And it, it is a very subtle system and I thought we could look at the Dhamma Sangani and what it says about mindfulness and its possibilities, where the directions it can lead. So it's a moment-by-moment -moment analysis. And I think the reason why people feel it's a little bit scholarly is because it can read a little bit, it can read a little bit clinically. Um, and I think it's like if you looked at an an EEG of somebody, uh, sorry, an, an ECG of somebody, you saw all these points, you think, well, where's the heart? <laughs> you know? And it, it is a bit like that. It shows you the points, but, but the heartbeat is, is what brings it to life. So, Dhamma Sangani explores and asks the question, what is present? Uh, and says, what happens? What are the states that are skillful? This is the whole of the Dhamma Sangani is really dedicated. First half of this. What is there when there is a mindfulness, when there is a skillful state of mind? And how do I recognize it? So I think if you see Abhidhamma just as a practical, almost like a, um, a lonely planet guide or a traveler's guide, how can I recognize when the, my mind is skillful and awake? So, before we do that, what I thought we'd look at is I've actually taught the Abhidhamma and uh, various aspects of mindfulness to a number of groups now that have been national health groups, people within the national health system learning how about mindfulness, um, with people doing who have suffered from post-traumatic stress and people suffering in some way from some anxieties, and also meditators. And I asked them a question, because I was quite curious myself. I asked them the question that the Dhamma Sangani poses, which is, how do you know 
when a state of mind is skillful? How do you know when there is mindfulness there? And so perhaps you might like to reflect yourself. How would you actually recognize a, a skillful state of mind? It's a really interesting question. So I've tried asking a number of groups, and I've come up. It's not a system. I only did it this way because I like the colors that the design thing showed me. There is no system here. But I've put them very loosely into I've just asked groups, and these are all words which people have said they have found um, would identify a skillful state of mind. So that it could be anything from helping a child, saving a child falling under a car, or helping a neighbor, or experiencing deep meditation, or going on a hike and just feeling a great sense of exhilaration and enjoyment. And I just asked people, what is it you want and recognize from a skillful state of mind? So I'll just read them out. And there isn't any order here. I, I simply like, the, the, you know, I just did it by the colors that came up. Now, what I would say I'd noticed was that people who, and this is not a scientific study, people who've come from, come to mindfulness uh, because of trauma, um, one group of people I did this with were people who'd served in Afghanistan and Iraq and had suffered from post-traumatic stress. So what people who've, in the immediate aftermath of really unhappy events want is if you could almost say like the diminishment of, of suffering. You know, they want just the suffering to go. And they don't want to feel oppressed by worry, unhappiness, and anxiety. And I'd say that's a very strong motivation when people are, as we all know, when we've, we're in the great, uh, when we're grief-stricken or feeling really traumatized, we just want suffering to go a bit. And then that moves to just being able to cope when things go wrong. And people felt that that was something they wanted from mindfulness and a skillful mind. They wanted more confidence. And they use then words like energy, alertness, balance. Um, and then as they recollected times when they had been, they felt some skillful state of mind, they used words like agility, lightness of body, strength, flexibility, the ability to do a number of different things. Um, a lot of people want exploration and adventure. <laughs> That's a really, I think it's a very deep, the quest drive is, is somehow very deep in us all. Purpose, challenge, things don't have to be easy. People sometimes said they felt really, the skillful mind came when they had a real challenge to, to face. Um, and we can see here words that people might use in modern times, like feeling connected, engaged, wholehearted. Caring came up a lot, but also feeling carefree. If you love what you do, depth of feeling, overcoming doubts, joy and happiness, focus, well-being. And we see how much people want well-being the moment it's such a, a word that's used a lot being in the moment being in the flow being in the zone and some people would take it deeper and say they felt their most at their most mindful and alert when there was a very strong sense of great love or, or um, a, a sense of the infinite uh, humor <laughs> and wisdom now people may have very different lists but I found that this type of list tends to be produced by most gatherings of people, whatever their motives for doing mindfulness, they will all tend to come up with, in a large group, you will tend to come up with these things. Other people, I, I think it's something, I'd be really interested if other people tried it, because uh, I found that by and large people do come up with the same things they want from an alert and skillful mind. So let's look at what the Abhidhamma says. And actually, if you look at these factors, you find that the Abhidhamma offers the same things in Pali. <laughs> it 
if you were to translate these terms into Pali, the language confidence, mindfulness, self-respect, a sense of worth, regard for consequence, generosity, loving kindness, balance, the ability to let go, and also this sense of the, the challenge of interest of something, applying the mind, exploring, releasing onto things. This is something that's very important in Indian, idea that you could just release onto something. You're wholehearted. Vigor, wish to do, purpose, and attention. And here is the next part of the list. It didn't all fit on one. The body and the mind seem to come, become more quiet. There's lightness of body and mind, softness of body and mind, readiness of body and mind. Competence is a word for health. You just want to feel your mind and body healthy. And uprightness, it's the word uju, straight. Now, what is interesting is that mindfulness is the determinant of this state and it also always is accompanied by ethical considerations. So if you're sitting, being very mindfully eating and uh, pushing everybody out of the way to grab the food at the table, that is not actually mindfulness according to this system. <laughs> you, know, you can be very mindful. And the ethical um, element in mindfulness is it always comes with these ethical factors. You do actually care about other people if you are mindful. And I think that is something that's worth saying, which I haven't seen in clinical uh, definitions. Also, there will always be, even in one moment of mindfulness, there will always be a taste either of loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, or equanimity. It always exists with what are called uh, the divine abidings. And sometimes wisdom, if you're lucky, there's wisdom. So this just summarized my, my findings, that, that those suffering from the very severe problems seem to want a diminishment of suffering, and those who become interested in meditation or looking for, perhaps at a loose end, looking for purpose in life, want direction and, and the happier side, but that all in the end tended, if you asked a group of any of those sort of people, they would all tend to want the same sort of things. And I just sort of summarized them here. Ethics, very much part of mindfulness, engagement of the body, loving kindness, a sense of potential. And I think if we think of ourselves that when we felt most selfless, it's oftentimes when we are really alert, playing musical instruments, swimming. And what is interesting is in this system, those qualities are there at a moment of skillfulness, but they're also there at the moment of enlightenment, that they will, will be there. They're exactly the same. So the alertness we can have now is just what we will need if we go into deep meditation or into uh, enter the path. So here we have where after mindfulness? So I actually, these are starlings in uh, Otmore, where I live in Oxford. And I don't know if you know anything about starlings, but they have what are called murmurations, which are very beautiful. And I read something by um, a man called uh, Mr. Sharp, who is a great recorder of, of musical oral traditions and how they seem to develop and change in time. And he compared the development of uh, oral music and of uh, these folk traditions to a murmuration of starlings. And I think it's very applicable to how our consciousness moves direction, that the starlings have a great sense of direction and purpose. They know where they're going on their migratory paths, but they do it in all sorts of ways. And that skillful chitter is, in a way, gives a seedbed for all these possibilities. 
There are few things in nature more wonderful and more incomprehensible than the ordered flight of a flock of starlings. Many thousands of these birds will fly together in a compact mass. They wheel about in the air and describe orderly evolutions without hesitancy and with a precision which argues complete unanimity of purpose. If attention be concentrated upon the bounding lines of the moving and living mass, it will be noticed that these are not so clearly defined as when casually observed, they appear to be. The edges, instead of being smooth and even, are rough and jagged. Further observation will show that th these irregularities are due to the aberrations of flight on the part of individual birds who are constantly separating themselves from their fellows, darting out at acute angles to the line of the flight and then swiftly returning to the flock. Every now and then, however, it be seen that one of these birds is followed by the rest and the course of flight of the whole mass is immediately changed. I think this is a wonderful image for how our mind moves on a path, that we have all these factors and mindfulness is just one of, one of these uh, starlings, if you like, but it knows the direction, but it's willing to explore. So uh, for what happens after mindfulness, uh, I would suggest the seven factors of awakening is the, the direction. These are the, the Buddhist path of the factors of awakening. These, to me, seem to be qualities you could find in any religious tradition and at a secular level. They, they are qualities which set the direction. And it seems to me that it would be very helpful for us to do mindfulness and to see it as part of a, a larger process as well, uh, whatever tradition we practice in. And this is mindfulness, exploration, vigor, joy, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. And I practice in a tradition which puts a lot of emphasis on the joy. The um, Southeast Asian Buddhist traditions tend to do this, their meditation. Some traditions of meditation are much more investigative, and I think the secular traditions tend to work more from investigation uh, as a way of improving our psychology, if you like. But I would suggest that these roots, these are all roots that will help the starlings uh, find their home. So that's uh, what I would suggest as, as a follow-up to mindfulness and really to suggest directions. Um, it always worries me whenever I see in a book that something's definitely this, and mindfulness is definitely this. <laughs> I wanted to make, uh, to communicate a sense of the great possibilities of this, this quality that it can go in so many directions. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Uh, so we have some time for questions, um, and uh, I would ask people to please step up to the microphone when asking a question so that uh, Dr. Shaw can hear the question, and so uh, the question and the response uh, that she gives can uh, be part of our recording, which we'll be posting on the Contemplative Studies website. Um, so actually, uh, Sarah, since... I seem to have the microphone in my hand. Um, um, can I begin with uh, so this very, very interesting kind of expansion uh, of the, the range of associated meetings of, of mindfulness? But I wanted to ask you to reflect on something we spoke about in, in our seminar on uh, Thursday. And that is that I was uh, uh, talking about, I was giving a, a talk about the uh, Abhidharma, the Sarvastivadin Abhidharma uh, categories of, uh, of uh, into which all experience can be broken down and, and combined up. And we talked about the difference between mindfulness and right mindfulness. Mm. And the, uh, a student asked a question about can you be, can you mindfully kill someone? Mm. And so in that context, I wonder if you'd reflect on what might be differences between the, the uh, 
uh, Abhidharma or Abhidhamma tradition mm. um, as reflected in, in two different uh, schools as uh, Buddhism. That is very interesting. And it's something I think about quite a bit because mindfulness is used in so many contexts now. And according to this system, the one that I'm talking about here, at the moment of taking another human life, there is no mindfulness present. Mindfulness is actually a determinant of skillful consciousness. And if it's not there, then the mind is not skillful. In the system of Abhidharma, the Indian, the Abhidharma Kosha, um, there is a difference between mindfulness and right mindfulness. And um, the, the terrorists planting a bomb or somebody uh, doing something uh, that intends to kill could actually have some mindfulness, but it would be tainted. So either way, it's a slightly different understanding, but in effect, the, the, you could not at the moment of killing another being have mindfulness, right mindfulness. No, it would, the two couldn't exist together. Yeah. Which I think is very interesting. And, and, and when we, we have a lot of secular understandings of mindfulness, but I would say that in all systems of Buddhism, if there is any um, harm to another being, at that moment there is, is no mindfulness. Yeah. Well, this opens up a whole really interesting mm. set of uh, questions. Um, mm. uh, so, so in that moment, if there is no... If there's an equation of mindfulness with, with a kind of an ethical uh, action. Yeah, yeah. And it, 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 mindfulness will always be ethical. <laughs> yeah. So if you if you're hospitable to somebody and there's mindfulness, it will always be ethical and it will always have an innate sense of uh, balance and loving kindness or one of the divine abidings. And, and so in this, this is a Theravada mm, In the Theravada system. And implied in Abhidhamma Kosha, really. Yeah, if it's yeah. right mindfulness. Yeah. So, so the whole issue of um, training somebody um, who is a warrior in some fashion to be more mindful in the way they go about their work um, in all aspects, including combat, um, can it be, by this definition, can it ever be mindful if it involves taking of another human life? Um, it could be mindful before or after. I think anybody who knows the military will know there's a very strong sense of morality that often operates. I don't know about in the US, but certainly I know people in the army in the UK there's a very strong sense of uh, morality. And I think there's just an acceptance of responsibility that there may have to be the taking of life, but it is not wanted. And one could say that in Buddhist terms, it is an acceptance that at the moment of killing somebody, there cannot be a good state. And I think all good soldiers know that. And um, the soldiers are always the last who want to go to war. You know, they... they uh, in my experience of, of, of contact with the military, I, d I don't see any enthusiasm to, to fight. Um, it's something you have to do. And you could have mindfulness before and afterwards, but you would still have the karmic responsibility for that weighty action. <coughs> Hello. Hello, yes. Uh, thank you Thanks. very much for giving your talk. I was wondering how you could differentiate the experience of mindfulness from the experience of right mindfulness. Because often I feel as though I might be acting in a mindful manner and realize later that I was very much not. Uh, so if you could speak to that a little bit. Um, well, according to, to the, the, the system, if there really is mindfulness there, there really is mindfulness there, even if only for a moment. And it, what, it, but we often have the, the sense that we're trying to arouse mindfulness and we get it wrong. But that's, that's fine. It, it will tend eventually to come to mindfulness. Thank you. I think we all have that with, with say, watching the breath or trying to observe the breath. Your mind wanders and it happens to us all. And then we get interested. And the minute you get interested, the mindfulness will increase. Does that help? 
Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm over here. Yes, hello. hello. Um, thank you so much. That was wonderful, um, expansive, and deep at the same time. And the image of the starlings will stay with me for a long time. That mm. was f mm. just wonderful. Mm. Murmurations, I'll be dreaming of them, uh, both <laughs> literally and metaphorically. Um, I, my question is about what are the Brahma Viharas, the, the mm. divine abodes? I've, I've just always been curious to know more about them, and so this just seems like a great opportunity. Uh, but I was particularly struck to, to see, to, to learn today, that they're identified with mindfulness in mm. some way. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so my sense of the, the, these are the four Brahma Viharas, these four um, sort of light states, one of them being loving kindness, mm -hmm. most famous. Um, and I just, I, try to, I sometimes imagine them as, um, I, I think of heavens, I think of them being elsewhere, above mm. us or something. Mm. But in this description, they seem to be very imminent mm -hmm. or to, to be non-spatial in some yeah. way, to sort of tr be somehow omnipresent. Um, and accessible in any yeah. place. So I, I'm, I'm not sure that I've understood correctly, and I, I don't know what the Brahma Viharas are. Can you enlighten us? What, okay. what are Brahma Viharas? Okay, thank you. That's a very interesting question. A Brahma Vihara is living uh, with Brahma, and Brahma is the lord of the, of the meditative heavens. So he's almost like a metaphor for this great expansive being that fills the whole universe. And the Buddhists just slightly shifted that so that what, a, what they felt was the real Brahma was the four faces of uh, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity as four ways to view any event in the world. And it's something that arises. The Buddha always seemed to internalize things and bring them back to volition, to chaitana. So it's, they are there in our minds and can be found. They can be almost, if you like, invoked or found. So when mindfulness is present, one of them will always be there, it's said, in, according to this system, not in the Abhidharma, when right mindfulness is there. There'll always be a touch of them. And um, metta, loving kindness, is kindness towards uh, all other beings. Compassion is a sense of being able to be still where there is suffering, just to find stillness. And so obviously that helps. Uh, ourselves and others. Uh, joy is considered even more fine, and that is joy in um, other people's good fortune. <laughs> How to take joy in other people's good fortune. Um, and I spoke to um, a Buddhist monk who worked in Buddhist chaplaincy, and he said that's the one that is the most important and the most difficult. It's very easy to feel sorry for people. <laughs> Uh, but actually to take delight in their pleasures is, the mo is much more important, oddly enough, in helping people recover than uh, compassion. I mean, you need the compassion, but to be able to delight in, in other people's happiness. It's quite a, you may just catch a moment when you can do that. And then equanimity is a kind of depth of feeling where you are untroubled by partiality. And these are all qualities which it's said that mindfulness always accompanies in this system. And I think we can say that it may just be a little bit of it, a smidgen, but there'll be something of it there if there is a real alertness. We've all had the experience, um, I think as James said, of trying to be mindful and not succeeding. But the moment genuine mindfulness is there, there will be something of that quality there. Either you love what you're doing or you'll really enjoy it or something will open up. That, that, that is what is said in, in the system and I think it's interesting to try and apply it and see it work in our lives too. <laughs> Does that answer your quest all your questions? All of them. Right, good. <laughs> oh, that's very helpful. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Hello. I had a question about joy, which I guess you answered already, but I, I had already walked up to the microphone, so I can't go back. No. I, I would just <laughs> like you to talk a little bit more about the ways in which one is to cultivate joy for others, but also being able to open oneself to seeing beauty in the world and holding that intention with also seeing a lot more injustice and pain because you're being mind, because you're opening up, because you're exploring, because you're seeing things more clearly, or mm -hmm. you're, you're looking for things that might have otherwise gone 
uh, that others might be oblivious to precisely because they haven't cultivated that mindfulness. So I, I, I guess I want to hear more about the ethics of holding these two things in tension and then knowing when, when is it appropriate to, to allow yourself to feel joy, not just joy for others, but also enjoying things that are beautific or beautiful in the Anytime. world. Anytime. Okay. <laughs> There's nothing. It's, it's if it becomes attached, that's the problem. I mean, if you just sort of think, oh, I have to keep on to this feeling forever and ever. I must have this feeling and, you know, grasping. Um, but any, any appreciation or joy and beauty is there in all, all over the early Buddhist texts. It's a, a completely erroneous idea that there is some sort of rejection of that. You know, you don't reject the world. You can enjoy it. <laughs> How would you bring that in conversation with questions of complicity today? Because I assume complicity wasn't an issue in these texts um, back then. Mm. But it's, it's very, um, one of the things I have struggled with going through academia is that being open to and being exposed to critical theory mm. um, has come with a certain um, vulnerability to feeling um, you can't do much about your complicity. It just becomes very, it becomes like a mm. burden that you can't, that you can't keep carrying. Mm. And sometimes it causes, an, it causes you um, guilt or shame when you allow yourself moments to feel joy. Because you ask yourself, no, do I deserve indulgence. That? The Buddhist tradition would say uh. that would be indulgence to you. You enjoy things that are to be enjoyed. Uh. And if you are responsible for harming another being at any time, then you take responsibility for that. Um, but you don't have to go around causing pain to yourself. That, that's not alertness. So you can still take just as much action to help out other mm -hmm. people, work, you know, um, but you don't have to allow the mind to be moved by anger, and you'll be much more efficient. Mm -hmm. if, you've, if you've ever done martial arts, you'll know that you're actually a much better martial art expert if you don't experience anger. Okay. Uh, and it, it, it's... Because you're you're helping other people, it doesn't mean you have to be unhappy. Yeah. Does that answer your yes, question? Yes, it does. Perfectly. Thank you. Good. Okay. <laughs> May I from over here? Oh yes. Hello. Yeah. Hi again. Um, <clears throat> well, I I just experience this last exchange, this lecture, this program as such a profound sense of joy, and. But one of the things that I'm enjoying most is noting the occasional, since I'm a sociologist, the ah, occasional yes. appearance yeah. of a social scientific mm. disposition, and then never quite realizing it. And I don't know whether it's a kind of incompatibility mm -hmm. with social science's foundations mm. So I was hoping you would say no. Mm, mm, mm. But I wonder, could we go back to your your four by four table? Yes. Uh, which one? See, that's that you know, with the sixteen dispositions. Oh yes, that was really just. Um, it turned out to be sixteen. I didn't didn't try and make. No, but I mean, this is the sociologist love. We right. Love, no, we I love I, tables. I just like the colors, and, and the, it just and turned the tables out, yes. are beautiful. But. <laughs> <laughs> what I was, you know, when, yeah. Hal no, I, was, no, yeah. when Hal was saying, you know, we yeah. should have social science in this conversation, mm, too. Mm, mm. This is a beautiful moment of social science, mm. you know, but I'm not going to obsess with how you collected your sample and all of this, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. <laughs> but what I will, but what I'm curious about is whether these are all expressions that are com compatible or consistent with mindfulness, yeah? Mm-hmm. But are some of them more profound, more consistent, more, you know, you were already sort of dis discerning different kinds of mm -hmm. mindfulness here from, I can't even say it because I'm too ignorant in this. But how would you ident begin to stratify these responses, or could you, in terms of their implication in a right mindfulness? I think that's a wonderful and interesting question. And I think they are almost qualities that you would have almost like in different depths. Mm. So wisdom, you may not even have, there may be, you know, if somebody just is really kind-hearted, they might not have any wisdom about what they're doing. They just, at that moment, so there will be hardly any wisdom. 
whereas if it would that particular quality could deepen and deepen and mature or grow if you like to use our sort of vegetative uh, uh, analogies and I would say that you're asking if any of these are privileged in a way I would say those seven factors I meant I mentioned at the end are considered particularly important but the rest are considered to be things that would be all there latent in any moment of mindfulness. So that they could, for instance, you could become more, um, you, it could be developed into great love, or somebody could act very ethically in a certain situation, it could be the ethics was very strong. That my understanding is that you'd have to have a kind of um, a GIS system, three-dimensional map or something to show how each one could, could work or move or shift the others. Um, I think it is, I, I, I also am interested in how we can have a conversation with, with, clearly, sociology has so much to offer. And of course, this was a completely unsociologically, it was non-professional <laughs> sociologically. But, but it, it would be interesting to see what conversations could be had because I think in, in that, the, that lady's question just now about complicity, there were all sorts of, a number of issues which I chose not to address, largely because I'm, I don't actually know a lot about them and I didn't want to um, get too involved. And I, try, I was trying to go back to first principle, really. And if I can go back to first principle, then one hopes that the sociologists would be able to make something of it. So my colleague Hiro Saito, who spoke here earlier in the fall, yeah. uh, is one such person, so I will introduce you. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Oh, right, okay, yes, I see, yes. But did that, it didn't answer your question, I'm afraid, but, uh, but I hope that no, 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 it's... Right, because I don't have the qualifications to, to uh, answer it properly. So, <laughs> but I'd be interested if anybody can. Yes, thank Hi, you. So thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, I'm curious about, um, so I, I'm in the field of psychology and we talk a lot about mindfulness as kind of a non-judgmental mm -hmm. acceptance of whatever someone mm -hmm. is feeling in the moment. Mm. Um, and I noticed that that has, feels like it's in contrast in some ways with the way you're talking about Mm -hmm. mindfulness as a kind of purposeful cultivation of mm -hmm. wholesome mind states mm -hmm. um, and also kind of a guarding against mm -hmm. unwholesome mm -hmm. mind mm -hmm. states. So I, I'm just curious if you would characterize the kind of current understanding in psychology as yes. in some yeah. sense wrong or no. if that... No, okay. absolutely not at all. Um, that, was a, that has been a very useful technique, I would say, the non-judgmental awareness. And it's very important in modern psychology, but particularly as we have such a heritage, often, uh, I, I mean, people blame it on Freud or the Abrahamic traditions or whatever, the original sin, uh, whatever it is, Westerners, for some reason, uh, feel uh, burdened by things that are wrong with them. And various people are blamed for this, and I'm sure <laughs> it's not, but for whatever reason we do. So that the prime intention of the early mindfulness um, teachers in the West was to bypass that sense of guilt. <laughs> I mean, I've actually been in, in context with American Buddhists where we wanted to talk about the five precepts, and they said, oh, we can't do that, it's the, uh, not to kill, not to steal. Oh, we can't do that. People think we're being very judgmental. <laughs> and you sort of think, well... <laughs> honestly it happened to me last year we were going to include the five priests and they said oh, no we mustn't do that it's, it's, it, it will be too judgmental now the thing is if you the, the, you're suggesting there is a problem whereas there isn't if there really is a non-judgmental awareness according to this tradition there will be an intuitive shrinking away from harm to self or others. I can't ask anybody to take that on faith, but if you actually do become aware of the breath in a non-judgmental way, way, you will not want those mental states associated with harming others or oneself. It's like there is a turning away. 
and to think of them as being in some ways separate or extra add-ons is our, our kind of um, categorical mind um, suggesting there is a problem when there isn't. And I think it's very simple. If you are really mindful and you're in a, a line with somebody, you don't cue barge. Or a, and very, on very small incidents, if you're mindful, you won't do things that are unethical. And, and the, the Buddhist tradition wouldn't see that flow from mindfulness and alertness to acting ethically as being like a big step, I'm now going to act ethically. It would just be a natural outflow of being alert. Does that answer your question? I, I think there's quite a big conversation to be had here. but uh, yeah, yeah, I guess I'm still a bit curious about whether accepting an unwholesome state would be considered mindfulness. Oh, what, what do you mean to, to, to... So if, if mindfulness is about guarding against an unwholesome state, mm. is mindfulness accepting that state, or is mindfulness actually... A, like, if it's I, arisen, you, you don't reject it. You are, mm. um, you're aware of it. But it, that awareness will protect you from that state dominating your mind. It will protect okay. you from the ruminations that will kind of go on and on okay. if you have that mindfulness. Of, of that state. Interesting, thank you. Does that answer the questions at all? Yeah. I think, I think yeah, there are think a I, lot yeah. of conversations to be had. Cool. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question, Sarah. Yes. Thank yeah. you for your yeah. talk. It was very interesting. Um, so my question has to do with, with uh, judging non-judgmentally. Yes. Um, so, I mean, it seems like it's obviously like a very important skill to be able to judge your own behavior, to be able to kind of judge your thoughts and discern what might be wholesome, unwholesome, yeah. skillful, non-skillful. Um, is there a contradiction between judging non-judgmentally and how, how, does that, how does that kind of work together? Um, I think this word judgment is difficult. We, I, I prefer to use something like a kind of discernment. It's like you sort of feel that isn't really the way to go. You know, and if you walk into a room and there's about to be something going on that is really, you know, they're going to rob a bank or something. It, it, there's a kind of instinctive shrinking from that activity. And it isn't judging in the same way. It's not the same as judging, which, would, which of course, has been the bugbear of so much uh, Western psychology, uh, this sense of what can we do about the fact that people judge themselves so much. Um, and it isn't like that. It's a more unethical instinct. Um, so I tend to avoid the word judgment. That's very helpful. But that's Thank not you. the same as discernment. You know, you smell something a bit wrong in a situation. <laughs> you know, somebody's selling you some insurance. <laughs> really? And, uh, and, and you just something, you're not judging the person, you're not... You know, you're not, you probably aren't judging them at all. They're very convincing or whatever. But something, there is some instinct in you, and that would be mindfulness. It would be that protective aspect. It is really simple things rather than grand questions. That, and, and we have all been there. You go into a situation, you, if you're mindful, you, and maybe you can say your mind is subconsciously picking up messages in the world around us. But whatever it is, there is some instinct that accompanies alertness. Thank you. Does that answer? Yes, yes, yes it does. Right, okay. Uh, so Hi. Uh -huh. I'd just like to invite you to comment on a couple aspects of mindfulness that haven't really been featured in the talk so far, yes. and yeah. wonder how you feel like they fit into what you have been presenting. Uh, and those are uh, the Maranasati practice, or the keeping in mind death, or yes, recollections yes, yes, of death. Yes. And also, in the context of mindfulness of the body, Considering the body and its component parts of blood and pus and sinew yeah, and yeah, so yeah, forth, yeah. Uh, you know, which ha these have very seemingly different affective directions, aiming towards like dispassion and disenchantment, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, how does that application of mindfulness, which you know is also in these earliest textual mm. sources, you know, fit into the overall picture that you've presented here for us today? Very good questions. I'll take them one by one. The recollection of death is recommended for everybody along with loving-kindness. You should always do it with loving-kindness. 
Um, it's like the, they used to have them, the skull, the memento mori in medieval times. And it's just to remind yourself of your mortality um, as a way of arousing something called samvega, which is a kind of energy. Uh, and and that it is actually considered a calm practice, the recollection of death, because it produces acceptance in the end. Uh, the other one of, of the parts of the body will depend on the tradition you're working in, but it, it is never there to arouse hatred. <laughs> sure, and I think hatred, words like, but something more like disenchantment, yeah. right? Nibida, right? You, you wouldn't like sort of feel so literally attached to it. You just feel looser, freer from within the body. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm still feeling like there's a bigger soteriological project, right, around the problems of karma, the problems of samsara, mm -hmm. the, the suffering intrinsic to being in cyclic existence, that these practices are also very much like directing you yes. towards like not feeling attachment for like continued life, right? Or continued mm -hmm. ongoing existence that is born of the problems of suffering and so forth. Mm. So I, I feel like there, it, it, the acceptance bit is, you know, I think, part of the picture, but I do think like there, there are these other affective states that are described quite clearly around feeling not just like love and joy and peace and contentment, yes. but a, a kind of, aversion's not the right word because obviously a, a turning that's, away. Yeah, yeah, turning away no. from, a, you know, the concerns of Those are world. all in yeah. the domain of equanimity. Right, okay. There's, that dispassion is all in the domain of equanimity, okay. that ability to let go. So that would be and, the and factor of a do remember that the, the, the yeah. doctrine of uh, dependent origination was always taught to people who would assume that the mind was essentially radiant. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> and I think we forget that. And, and it's always, um, it's something Southeast Asian teachers have always found very puzzling when they've come to the West, that if you start talking about dependent origination to Westerners, they can look very gloomy and serious. <laughs> Whereas in, if you start talking about that in Southeast Asia, people cheer up, you know, it's like a, a way of, becoming free it's mm -hmm. not uh, whereas we we do have unfortunate associations with of guilt really right. associated with it but everything you describe would actually be in and it's a very good question it, you're trying to stop it being too um touchy-feely sort of almost like loving loving kind of thing all the time well that might be the joy factor right, yes the joy yes so it's, uh, it, I just it, was, it's balanced I that, by equanimity that last answer is really yes exactly what i was looking for kind of where it would fit into that typology yes so thank you no it's a very good question and an important one the domain of equanimity is the largest right <laughs> yeah Moving slowly to the microphone to be sure that there are no other lingering questions. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening and uh, participating in the uh, question and answer. And special thank you to Dr. Sarah Shaw for brilliant uh, lecture and discussion. Thank you. Thank you.